The Sub-Saharan African region theme material is somewhat difficult stuff in some ways. It's also a little bit outside of the realm of the social sciences. We have to talk a little bit about history and how historical patterns have led to the way that resources are used around the world. In previous modules, we really talked about how humans use or are limited by resources. In this particular module, we're going to be talking about how the land is exploited, particularly how countries exploit parts of the world to their own advantage um, through colonialism and all the various things that are colonialism. So colonialism can mean many different things, but generally it means when one country is controlling another in order to exploit it for political ends, economic ends, or some sort of territorial ends, generally to get resources. This is a famous painting by um, the artist Blake showing Europe supported by Africa and Latin America, which is, of course, some of the fundamental regions that were involved in colonialism, Europe colonizing Africa and Latin America. Now, in the field of geography, those who look at colonialism, largely historical geographers, conceptualize it as being a core periphery exchange, meaning that there are a number of core countries, generally European countries, but not always, and then peripheral countries that fall under the regime of those core countries. And what's happening is that raw materials are being supplied by the periphery, largely agricultural goods and mining goods. And then the core is able to benefit directly from those raw materials, often creating an economic dependency in the peripheral countries themselves. One of the things that's very noteworthy about colonialism is, is it often produces dual economic systems. On the one hand, there is the indigenous economic system in the periphery that has been there for a long time. And then the colonial system starts to create a new economic system on top of that, which is really aimed at extracting as many resources as it can. And that often creates a lot of problems within the periphery country itself. It also requires the political reorganization of the periphery, and then ultimately the political and social marginalization in the periphery at the expense of the core. So generally speaking, when colonization takes place, those places in the periphery um, begin to um, lose a lot of advantages that they would already have in favor of what's taking place in the core. Now, European countries have used all sorts of different types of colonialism, really from the late 15th century to the late 20th centuries. And pretty much all regions of the world have been touched in one way or another. Even European countries themselves have been. You can argue pretty effectively that Russia used portions of the Soviet Union and other countries in its orbit in a peripheral way. Um, colonialism has had all sorts of different impacts. Most of those impacts are economic in that they have changed the economic system in the periphery, but they also transform the way that society actually works. And this is different from one country to another, but it can create everything from changes in fertility patterns to social structure. Of course, colonialism often had a very big political impact where it operated because the core countries needed to have some sort of administrative structure that would rule that country, usually negating whatever structures were already there or transforming them, co-opting them in ways that the core could use them. And then I think most people are familiar with the idea that colonialism had a pretty big cultural impact. Um, language usually was changed as European countries brought with them their own languages, insisted that those languages be used, and as a result, many parts of the world today speak Spanish or French um, or even languages like um, German and Portuguese and Dutch as well. European countries also brought religion with them as well that had a huge cultural impact, transforming religious belief and also impacting society in ways as well. 
Now, I'm not going to get into very much the impact of slavery, but slavery was, of course, a part of colonialism, especially in the early forms of colonialism, where the resource that was being extracted by the core from the periphery was actually human labor, forced human labor. And this impacts many areas, and I'll just briefly touch on it. And where I want to touch on it, specifically as we talk about colonialism in Africa, is to say that early on in the colonial process, of course, the slave trade had a really profound impact on Africa. But unfortunately, we don't really know much about that period, in part because there weren't many historical records, and we don't have a good sense of what was happening in Africa before the slave trade. There were certainly different political structures in Africa, but many of those political structures and the societies that supported them were so decimated by the slave trade, it's hard to know what exactly was there. So what happened as a result of this is that many of the early states in Africa, which certainly existed, were already impacted as Europeans started to insert themselves into the area and started to use this, this peripheral area. Um, early colonial efforts took place in a number of parts of the continent where the French, the Spanish, the English, the Portuguese, the Germans were all trying to get small parts of Africa. But it was really during the late 19th century that the so-called scramble for Africa took place, where European countries really began to contest against one another for large swaths of territory. In fact, in 1884, a conference was held in Berlin in which countries were able to essentially divide up the continent and take the portions that they wanted for themselves. <clears throat> Here's a map that shows uh, the impacts of that. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell all the colors here, but you can see that Africa has been cut up into a number of different sections that have different colors. Each of these colors represent a different colonial holding. In West Africa, you can see the sort of purplish pink color, which represents France. In the center, you can see the bright yellow color that shows the Belgian Congo. And then you can see another sort of lighter pink color that shows British holdings. Now, of course, the colonial holdings shifted and changed depending on what was happening in Europe, particularly on um, what happened before World War I and after World War I. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the really important thing to note here is that Africa was essentially cut into pieces by the Europeans. Now, all sorts of things happened as a result of this colonization of Africa. And, um, you know, it's hard to give broad generalizations about Sub-Saharan Africa because there are so many countries and so many colonies and so many different things happen. But I think it's fair to say that, generally speaking, um, colonies found ways to use the resources for their own benefits, economic, economically exploiting them and the labor that was there. But they also engaged in a lot of abuses. And some of the most important abuses include sort of the general ignorance of African culture and the way that um, tribal and ethnic power was articulated in Africa. And as a result of that ignorance or a lack of understanding or even just um, an unwillingness to recognize it, country lines were often drawn with no regard whatsoever for different types of tribal patterns. You often had one ethnic group or one tribal group being set against another in the colonial administration. So that colonial, colonialism by Europeans really helped to destabilize a lot of the internal ethnic and tribal power relations in sub-Saharan Africa. As I've already mentioned, one of the things that colonialism did was to really transform economic systems. And a great example of this is in West Africa, where the French really wanted to extract peanuts from West Africa for pressing into oil to use for um, food purposes and also industrial purposes as well. And they really imposed upon West Africa an agricultural system that was focused on creating a cash crop as opposed to subsistence crops, changing the way not only that agriculture took place, but even changing the way that the economy worked and how people made calculations about how to have children impacting total fertility rates as well. Colonialization 
also restricted rights and restricted the ability of people to determine their own future, their own right to create their own country for many, many decades. We've already talked very briefly about the fact that there were lots of cultural impacts as well as a result of colonization, proselytizing religion, changed indigenous religions, um, brought Christianity often in conflict with Islam, which was already firmly established in North Africa. Cultural impacts also extended to education. Oftentimes education um, was focused very much on the teaching of the European language that was dominant in the area, denigrating African cultural practices and creating sort of lasting cultural bruises uh, throughout many parts of the continent. Now, after World War II, there really started to be new views on rights and self-determination as a result of the nature of World War II and also the establishment of the United Nations, which began to articulate human rights and the right of a people to determine their own future. As a result of this, many European countries started to get out of the official business of colonization and went through a decolonization process. This decolonization, though, was pretty problematic because many of the former colonies were very economically dependent on this, uh, by this time, on the core. Their political structures were pretty weak because they had been dominated for so long by the European countries. And also what European countries had done often destabilized what the long-term future of political structures would be, often by setting ethnic and tribal groups against one another. And another very important problematic aspect of decolonization is it took place in the context of the Cold War, which meant that as soon as countries began to decolonize, uh, they were already being courted by either, on the one hand, the Western countries, most of whom were the colonizers, and the Soviet Union, who offered this alternative view of um, the economic system. And both the Soviet Union and Western countries poured large amounts of aid, including military aid, into Sub-Saharan Africa to support the leaders that they chose, who they thought would best serve their own interests. New countries were formed as a result of this, and while many of these countries were quite resource rich, all of the things that I just mentioned really complicated the political and economic situation of these countries. Tribal and ethnic relations began to impact um, the way that countries were being run. Because dependency had been created, there was still a, a very strong need to count on the core countries, which often meant that foreign aid and also military aid really went to propping up particular governments. And as a result of this, democracy really began to falter. And many states developed very authoritarian leaders and downright kleptocratic leaders as well. And a kleptocrat is someone who steals from his country, particularly foreign aid and resources in that country um, for the benefit of himself or for the benefit of his own tribal members. And this is Mobutu Sese Seko, a very colorful but very dictatorial leader in the country that we now know as the Democratic Republic of Congo, but which he styled as Zaire. Um, and Mobutu was known for being really a horrible kleptocrat who was supported, I'm sad to say, by Western countries, including the United States. Now, when the Cold War began to end, many of these corrupt states began to falter as well because they weren't getting the military and economic aid from the former Soviet Union or from the U.S., Britain, France, or whomever, as they had been before. And it created a huge power vacuum in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa. At the same time, arms began to flood into Africa, in part because the Cold War was ending, and there were lots of cheap arms available that could be sold. These arms were snapped up by all sorts of rebel groups, different ethnic groups who had felt that they had been treated poorly during um, not only colonization, but after decolonization during independence as well. And it led to an increased amount of conflict throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Ultimately, you saw huge upwellings of ethnic tensions that led to various types of 
reprisal killings, and even genocides in some situation. Major civil wars flared throughout large portions of sub-Saharan Africa, and you had the rise of independent militia groups who were completely untrained and not really loyal to anybody, which led to large-scale civil war and conflicts and a few conflicts that spilled outside of countries, um, leading to essentially um, regional wars within sub-Saharan Africa. As a result of all this new conflict, there were significant numbers of war crimes and human rights violations taking place in sub-Saharan Africa in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War. And there are all sorts of different reasons for this. Uh, I've listed the major ones here. Um, most of the state systems in these countries were very ineffective. Central governments were failing and not doing what they should have been done. Militaries were untrained and independent militaries or these various rebel groups were also untrained as well. No one really had any sense of how war should be conducted, how you should not involve civilian populations, and as a result of this, rights violations really became rampant. Now this is not to say that in other wars in other parts of the world you don't have human rights being trampled on as well, but in Sub-Saharan Africa it was really exceptional. And exceptional also in part because there were problems with education and literacy and an understanding of international rights and what international expectations of warfare were. Eventually many of these wars started to recruit and use child soldiers as pictured here. Many of these child soldiers of course were far too immature to know how to conduct war and were themselves um, both the victims of human rights violations and then the perpetrators as well. And I think it's also important to note that there was a general international failure um, of countries outside of Sub-Saharan Africa trying to intervene, trying to ensure that um, universal human rights were in fact being respected. Some of the really important impacts that have taken place as a result of these conflicts and all of the problems associated with them were, of course, that basic human rights have been violated in many of these conflicts. But you also had large-scale forced migration and ethnic cleansing as well, which has led to a huge refugee pro problem in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as a problem of internally displaced people, people displaced within their own country. You also have still a lot of ethnic tension that is um, left over as a result of these civil wars. Violence was directed towards women in many of these conflicts as well. So large numbers of women in sub-Saharan Africa were victims of sexual crimes that were perpetrated against them by militant combatants. And there's a, a large problem dealing with this, not only because the women were traumatized, but because they were often now isolated from their own societies because of the stigmas attached with being raped. Reintegrating former combatants or reintegrating women who've been stigmatized um, is extremely difficult and one of the major barriers to development in the region right now. In addition, there are huge difficulties in governing in this sort of post-conflict era and many countries are only just now beginning to rebuild their states but of course they typically need to have a lot of support from outside, um, from the old core countries and other countries to ensure that good government governance actually does take place. So there are lots of conflicts that took place in Sub-Saharan Africa. I've listed some of the key ones right here. The crisis and war in Darfur, which you'll be exploring in Google Earth if you haven't done so already. The South Sudanese Civil War, the civil wars in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and most recently the Central African Republic Civil War. These have all sorts of different origins. Many of them are linked to ethnicity and also religious beliefs as well. Um, I'd like you to take a look at some of these um, wars and get a sense for what their basic history is. Sort of standing in a league of its own in terms of the problems associated with them and also the ferocity of these wars, and genocides was the Rwandan genocide and civil war, which itself engendered major regional conflict in and around the Congo, known as the First and Second Congo Wars.
uh, both the genocide and these wars are very complicated. There are many factors in them. I'm not gonna, going to attempt to explain them right now, but I'd like you to do just a little bit of research about these um, conflicts as well. So you have some understanding uh, both of the nature of the complexity of these wars and the problems associated with them as well. Now the aftermath of colonialism, decolonization, and the post-Cold War era, as you can imagine, has really impacted governance. Democracy and its institutions are often very weak in sub-Saharan African countries. Some are stronger than others. Some have had less conflict than others. But having good governance in place is really critical to ensure that development can take place. If you don't have a strong government, it impacts economic growth and all of the various things associated with it, many of which we've already touched on. People need to have access to education. They need to be, feel secure in their person. They need to have support for economic growth. And these things really can't take place if you don't have strong governments. So solving the problems of good governance in sub-Saharan Africa to deal with all these conflicts, many of which were spurred on by the problems of colonization, are really critical to the development of the region. Now, one of the positive things in sub-Saharan Africa is that many countries are really resource rich. And a lot of them are really starting to re leverage those resources now. In the past, they were mostly exploited for the benefit of core countries and for these kleptocratic regimes. But now, many of these countries have the opportunity to develop them, but they need to have that good governance. They also need to have a land tenure system, which will really support the rights of individuals and not just support the rights of tribal leaders who might use them for their own benefit. So again, it comes back to good government governance dealing with a lot of these problems. And it's worth saying that there's sort of a new scramble for Africa taking place right now. China is making huge investments in the region. And ironically, many of the former Western states are starting to pull back, including the United States, not investing as much in the region as before. And it sort of begs the question, who's going to win the new scramble for African resources? Will it be the West? And will the West sort of reform its ways and really try to instill principles of good governance in the region? Or will China um, begin to impact the region more and perhaps not protect human rights the way that other parts of the world, world will? 